Good evening. We're going to begin with hymn number 633, please. 633. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Saviour above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Well, stand as we sing, let's sing with all our hearts, 633. Let's stand together. singing. But we're turning in the Word of God tonight, please, to Jonah chapter 3 again. Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to read the entirety of the chapter together, looking at the verse 5 as our text tonight, and looking at the subject, revival in Nineveh. Revival in Nineveh. And this is going to be the 15th message thus far out of the book of Jonah. But at this time, we'll read the whole chapter together. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at the verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast 
and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his precious word to each of our hearts. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, please, and ask for the Lord's blessing upon our study tonight. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and praise thee for the opportunity to be found in thy house this Wednesday evening. We thank thee for the privilege of having uh, the word of God, the scriptures of truth, open upon our laps. We thank Thee for this time when we can uh, come aside from the hustle and bustle of the things of this world, and we can study Thy Word together, we can sing Thy praises, and we can pray before the throne. And Lord, we realize that we really are a privileged people here in this place tonight. And nonetheless, we still make it our prayer, the chorus that we have already sung together, showers of blessings. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a falling, and we do believe that, Lord. We know that we have experienced tokens for good in recent days. Mercy drops round us our falling, but for the showers we plead. O oh God, we plead of thee that thou be pleased to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a mighty blessing upon us where there is not room enough to receive it. Lord, Thou hast done it in yesteryear. Thou didst do it at Pentecost. Thou didst do it in Nineveh. Lord, we know that Thou hast done it already in this province in 1859 and many other occasions besides. O God, be pleased to do it here. Be pleased to do it now. Be pleased to revive Thy people, we plead. For we ask these things in and through the Savior's lovely and most precious name. Amen. Revival in Nineveh. Now, the last time we were in the book of Jonah, we were looking at the verse 4 together, and we were looking at this mighty sermon that was being preached. Look at the verse 4 with me again. It says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, we see many wonderful things from this sermon. We noted five things the last time. We saw that it was an earnest sermon. This wasn't a man that was beating round the bush with flowery language and whispering in his speech. We find in the verse 4 it says, he cried and said. He was earnest. He wanted everybody to hear this wonderful message. We noted that it wasn't just earnest, but it was plain. Look what it says in the verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown wasn't a difficult message, wasn't a hard message to understand. It was perfectly plain, perfectly simple. Anyone that had any cognitive ability would know what the message was talking about, and anyone with their brain and gear would be able to understand the warning that was being set before them. We find that it was a humbling message. We find that Nineveh wasn't just a city, but it was a great city. Look at chapter 1 and the verse 2. We find it's not only a great city from the lips of the people of Nineveh, but it's a great city according to the lips of Almighty God. So truly it was a great city, a massive city. It says in chapter 1, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Look at chapter 3 in the verse 2. We find it recorded in the Word of God again how great it was. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city. 
a three days journey. You see an extra adjective there, exceeding great city. This was a huge place. Look at the verse 3 of Jonah chapter 3. We read, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Uh, and we, we find it there. Oh, the verse 2, sorry. The verse 2 is what I'm, I'm referring to. Go unto Nineveh, that great city. Then look at chapter 4 and the verse 11. You see it there again. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So we find this is a great city. It is an exceeding great city. As we read in the last verse of the book, it has 120,000 children that are not old enough to know their right from their left as yet. Many commentators believe it was possibly 60 miles in circumference. That is a huge city. When you think of, I was raised in the city of Liverpool. I think the city of Liverpool has uh, it's approximately 12 miles long, and it's a big city. Well, this is 60 miles in circumference. This is possibly a million or so of a population. What a city this is, and how humbling it was to receive this message of Jonah chapter 3 in the verse 4. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh, and this great city, and this exceedingly great city shall be overthrown. The Word of God humbles us. It was a gracious message as well, what he had to preach. We find that God didn't have to give Nineveh any warning whatsoever. He could have just removed them from the face of the earth, as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he didn't have to send a preacher. He didn't have to send an evangelist. And we find the lengths the Lord went to in order to get them an evangelist. He even created a particular whale to then transport this disobedient prophet all the way to Nineveh. And yes, it was a gracious message, and it was a fitting message. Because as we read in chapter 1 of Jonah, chapter, two, uh, chapter 1 and the verse 2, it says, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Why? For their wickedness is come up before me. And this message of overthrow, this message of judgment, it was a fitting message for this city because they were a wicked, wicked people. And you and I tonight in this nation of ours, when we consider our nation, I don't know about you, but I heard a wee bit of prime minister's questions. And, and the first opening question that our prime minister was questioned on, and I'm not even going to repeat it, the, the allegations that are going on about government ministers and the things they were doing, absolute filth, filth. Our nation is fit for judgment. And we are like Nineveh of old, where the prophets of God will be crying against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And this is the sermon that Jonah has been preaching. Jonah chapter 3 and the verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But tonight I want us to focus on six different things that we find in the verse 5. And this is revival in Nineveh now. Look at Jonah chapter 3 in the verse 5. It says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Isn't this incredible? I don't know about you, but this, this is amazing. This is, this is the greatest revival that has ever been known thus far in human history, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I want you to notice, first of all, number one, about this revival in Nineveh. Number one, the promptness of the revival. It was prompt, the promptness of the revival. Because we find in the verse 4, Jonah's preaching, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And immediately in the verse 5, we read, so the people of Nineveh believe God. It's immediate, straight away. They hear the word and they get on with getting saved. They hear the gospel and they believe God. They hear and it says, so the people. They did something immediately. And how often we are used to this idea of the word going forth and saying, I know the word applied to my heart today. I know I should be doing something. I know the Lord had a word in season for me, but I'll put it off to another time. And we're not prompt in acting upon the word which the Lord has given to us. But here, in Jonah chapter 3, when the word is preached, we find that no time is wasted 
at all. There's only promptness. And that's the only way we should ever react to the message of the Lord. No dilly-dallying, no slacking, no messing about, no beating around the bush, just getting on with doing what God has told us to do. And we find it in the gospel, of course. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and the verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and the verse 2, and we're going to visit some familiar verses, some familiar gospel verses tonight. And you hear about this all the time. We try and labor the point every time we preach the gospel. When the sinner is in hearing shot, we, we put the urgency upon them. We, we, we tell them that it's a matter of getting right with God, not tomorrow or next week or next month or on your deathbed. It's a matter of getting right with God now. And there is that idea of when you hear the word, you immediately react to it. You immediately come to Christ. You don't wait an hour. You don't wait a day. You don't wait a period of time. You come to him now. And it says in 2 Corinthians 6 and the verse 2, you know these verses well. It says halfway through, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There is this idea of being saved immediately after being convicted by the word. You read in Hosea 10 and the verse 12, it is time to seek the Lord. That idea of getting on with doing business with God straight away. You read it all the way back in Genesis chapter 6 and the verse 3, when it says, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There's this urgency in the gospel all the time that immediately when the word goes forth, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, there should be that prompt an immediate reaction. So the people of Nineveh believed God. But friend, it's not only applicable in the gospel. I apply it now to God's people because that's who's here tonight. You and I, children of the king, this is applicable to God's people. Come with me to James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1 and the verse 22. Because here we find what I believe is the problem with Christendom as a whole today. And let me just say a few introductory remarks to what we're going to point out in James here. I'm not talking about the apostasy tonight. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not talking about heretics. I'm not talking about wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm talking about truly, soundly saved people. And this is what the Lord tells us. The Lord tells us to be prompt. When we hear the word we to act upon the word. When we hear the voice of God, we are to act upon what he tells us. And it says in James chapter 1 and the verse 22, look at it with me, please. It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And look at these words, deceiving your own selves. If you're one that hears the word and you're one that knows, well, the Lord has spoken to me this Sunday morning or that Sunday night or that Wednesday night, the Lord had a very clear word for me. I know I need to do something about my life or whatever I was doing or, or the Lord in whatever sphere it is. The Lord gave me a word and I heard it, but I didn't do anything about it. That's folly. And there's no promptness. And we find that what we see in the revival in Nineveh was this immediate getting on with fulfilling what God had told them to do. Look at James chapter 4 and the verse 17 while we're in this book. James chapter 4 and the verse 17. Because it's okay saying, all right, preacher, I need to brush up on that. I need to get a wee bit better on that. So the Lord gave me a word and I've not been, I've not been doing it. I've, not, I've only been a hearer of the word. Well, friend, it's not just a matter of a slight slap on the wrist. We find the Lord exposes that folly for what it is and says in James 4 and the verse 17, <clears throat> Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if you're a hearer of the word and you refuse to be a doer of the word, this is among the people of God, then that is sin. That is us offending God. That is want of conformity or transgression of the law of God, as the catechism puts it. And we need to be very careful of that because we find in Luke chapter 11 and from the very lips of Christ, it says these words, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. There's a blessing. There's a blessing for you if you're going to be a doer of the word. 
And so there was a blessing for the people of Nineveh. The word comes to their souls, and we don't read of compromise. We don't read of dilly-dallying. We don't read of wasted time. We don't read of days or weeks or months of deliberation and debate or anything like that. We just read the sermon went out, and Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Prompt, immediate, no time wasted. I, I warn God's people tonight, at times, we can be very slow to act. And delay never brings any good. And for the sinner, at times, delay brings doom. And what a terrible plight that is. But we find the promptness of the revival. I want you to note with me, secondly, the priority in the revival. The priority in the revival. Look what it says again here in Jonah chapter 3 in the verse 5. So the people of Nineveh, believed God. So the people of Nineveh believed God. You know, people have some funny ideas about what revival is nowadays. I want to tell you this, a full church is not revival. A healthy church bank account is not revival. Having people singing well is not revival. Having every building and facility you could ever wish for, it's nice, but it's not revival. What is revival? Revival is what we read in the verse 5. So the people believed God. That's revival. And you can have a full church, and you can have a full church of reprobates at times, but it's no good if they're not believing God. It's no good if they're not following the Word. It's no good if they're full of compromise and full of apostasy. And you see it with churches right across the land and across the globe. You can have mega churches with thousands of people pouring in on a Sunday, and you can have the music of the world, and you can have it all, and everyone thinks it's just great. But is it revival? No, because revival, this is the foundation this is the priority for the people believed God. And that's what we need. That's what we're praying for in Money Slain. And we need to remember that. Yes, it would be lovely to see these seats filled. I have no doubt about that. It would be lovely to see every pew, every nook and cranny of this facility filled with sinners. It would be wonderful to see that. But we are not praying that the Lord would fill these seats and fill the pews and finish there. We are praying that the people of Money Slain and the district would believe God. That's what we're praying for. That's the result we want to see. And that is true revival. It's all about faith. It's all about this belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, revival, let me say this, revival comes through preaching. That's what we find here. Look what it says if you look at the verse 2. The verse 2 of chapter 3 of Jonah, it says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and look at it now, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. How did the revival start? Was it because Jonah set up a youth club with a lot of wee gimmicks and kicking a football about and doing this, that, and the other and, and really trying to be cool and get down with the next generation and all this sort of crack? Is that why revival came? No. It's because he preached unto it the preaching that the Lord bid him. It was through the preaching of the Word. Look at the verse 4. Was it a popular message that he preached? How did revival come? He says, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. There's nothing popular about that. There's no ear tickling there. There's nothing nice. There's no heartwarming, cozy wee encouragement to get you through the week. There's none of that there. We find it's preaching that the Lord has said. It's preaching of overthrow. It's preaching against sin. It's crying against it for their wickedness. It's telling them of judgment to come. It's warning them of hell. It's this idea of being overthrown. And we find then in the verse 5, the people of Nineveh believe God. Now that's not the type of preaching people like to hear. That's not the type of preaching that the apostasy advocate. That's not the type of preaching that people say, well, if you want to fill your pews, you want to get people in the monish lane, well, maybe throw out the organ and bring in the drum kit. Maybe you want to clear out the pews and bring in seats so you can clear it all the way and use it as a sports hall. Maybe you want to do this or do that or do the other thing. And it's full of compromise. And yes, you may fill the seats, but you won't have the presence of God. Because revival, it's this idea of believing God, believing the Word. And revival comes through preaching. It never comes through gimmicks. 
Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want you to see this. I want God's people to be encouraged tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because we find that we are told in 2 Timothy that the troublesome times are coming. In fact, let's look at 2 Timothy 3. Let's go over this a wee bit. Let's see, what what kind of days are we living in? What kind of days is Paul warning this young preacher, Timothy, the type of days he's going to be preaching in? It says, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And we read a whole list there, and we can say, yeah, that's us. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Yep, we see that one. Covetous, yep, we see that. Boasters, we note that. Proud, well, June was meant to be Pride Month, wasn't it? People being proud, people flaunting their abomination before the Lord. We certainly see proud blasphemers. I don't know about you, but I heard this week that there's, uh, I think next week there's going to be some uh, mega uh, Muslim rally or something in West Belfast in one of the GAA grounds there. Uh, And this, this complete blasphemy against the Lord that is going to go on show. Disobedient to parents, yep, we see that. Broken homes and the way, the, way, the way things are going on in society. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. We're only in verse 2. We see it today. And they're the days we are living in. And we find it says in the verse 13 of chapter 3, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And you say, could it get any worse? And what does Paul advise young Timothy? Does he say, bring in the gimmicks? Does he say, loosen it a wee bit? Does he say, don't be so strict anymore? Try, try liberalizing a wee bit. What does he say? Chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. Preach the word. Because that's the key to revival. That's the key to souls being saved. That's the key to a move of God. Just like Jonah in Nineveh, it's the idea of preaching the word the Lord has bidden. Preaching the word of God. That's where revival comes from. That's where revival is born, by preaching what the Lord would have us preach. We see it in Romans chapter 10 as well. And we find what does the Lord say? It says in Romans 10, 13, a famous gospel verse, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what does it say about reaching those people and seeing souls saved? Does it say gimmicks? Does it say liberalizing? Does it say compromise? Let's see, verse 14 of Romans 10. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So how are we going to reach those people? How are we going to see revival? How are we going to see the pews filled? How are we going to see people believe in God? It says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? You see, the Lord is calling for preachers, not calling for gimmicks, not calling for compromise. And I tell you this, we want to see revival. We stick to the blood and the book, and we don't go any further from that. The blood and the book, so the people of Nineveh believe God. And we find not only the promptness of the revival and the priority in the revival, they believed God, and it was through the preaching of truth. But I want you to note now, thirdly, the people of the revival. The people of the revival. Now, let's look back in Jonah chapter 3 and the verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Now that's quite an astonishing truth in and of itself. Let me just stop there a moment before we carry on. The people of Nineveh believed God. You know, we could read over verses like that and just think nothing of it. Keep reading, read the book of Jonah, maybe in one sitting. Don't come back to it till we're all the way around a year later. We come back to it again. We read it in 10, 15 minutes, and we forget all about it. Friend, let that truth grip your heart. Not any people. We're not talking about the Jewish people now, people that have been raised in the gospel, people that have been with the blood sacrifices, people that know of the temple and the altar and all of those things. We're not talking about that type of people. We're talking about violent people. We're talking about wicked people. We're talking about the people of Jonah chapter 1 and the verse 2 when it says, cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. We're talking about that group of people. And we're reading that the people of Nineveh, believe God. I want to tell you this tonight. No sinner is too hard for the Lord. No sinner is too hard for the Lord. 
And let this un- inspire us, even in the place of prayer. We think about a gospel mission we're going to be holding in just over a month's time now in Leitrim. You think of the people there. You think of our neighbors, people only three or four miles away, but people that are essentially poles apart of our way of thinking. Different religion, different politics, different way of life, completely different. The people of Nineveh, we could say. And at times, we as a Protestant people may even think of certain characters and say their wickedness as well. We may think of that. But the Lord saved these people. And the Lord can save our Republican neighbors too. And the Lord can save our nationalist neighbors and our Roman Catholic neighbors. And the Lord can do a work. And how will he do a work? Through the preaching of the word. That's how he'll do the work. Through the preaching of Christ. And this is the people of Nineveh. And look what it says in the verse 5. Let's keep going. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. Look at it. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't that astonishing? Now we're going to look at it in far more detail in in weeks to come. But we find, look at the verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Look at the verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. We find anybody that was anybody in Nineveh got saved. We find that the greatest pauper and sinner and wretch in the gutter was saved. And what do we read in the verse 5? From the greatest of them even to the least of them. And you know what the wonderful truth is this? That our God in Money Slain in 2022 is the exact same God of Jonah chapter 3 in the verse 5. We may look at our nation and we may despair at times, and rightly so. We may despair at our leaders and our politicians. I've already touched on the fact that the prime minister is the character that he is. And we are grieved by it. But the Lord in 2022 can still save from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Our God hasn't changed. Our God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will never change, for he is God. And if he could do it here, if he could revive with this group of people, if he could revive with this wicked group of people, if he could revive even their king that had led them in their wickedness for so long, can he not do it in Money Slain? Can he not do it with us? Now, when we look at this greatest, this great, great city, I I submit to you that this is the greatest revival in human history thus far. The greatest revival in human history thus far. We, we like to talk about Pentecost, and that was a, a wonderful, wonderful time. But let's read about Pentecost. Come with me to Acts chapter 2 and the verse 41. Acts chapter 2 and the verse 41, we read of God coming down in a wonderful way at Pentecost, and we read of how many were saved at Pentecost. And this was a wonderful revival, and this is not a revival to be sneered at at all. And I trust and pray that the Lord in Money Slain will give us a Pentecost in our day, in our generation, and that we will live to see the day when God comes down in might and power. But we read in Acts chapter 2 in the verse 41, Acts 2 verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized... And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. But I submit to you tonight that the revival in Nineveh made Pentecost look like a drop in a bucket. Nineveh had 120,000 babies. 
Nineveh had a population of possibly over a million people. And we don't read that one or two characters were saved. We don't read of a, a city or, or a particular region in the city was saved. We read the people of Nineveh, the collective group of people, the million or so people, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. We read of the king and his nobles making a decree so that nobody was outside of the bracket. The entire entirety of the city believe God what a revival a revival of quite possibly over a million people that is the greatest revival thus far in human history I tell you this there is a greater revival coming that revival will come when the Lord breaks through the clouds and we know that the earth will be covered with the knowledge of his righteousness we know that but thus far, Nineveh, this is the greatest revival that has ever been seen. And you know, people look at the book of Nineveh, and they say, isn't it astonishing? Look at, look at Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17 again. What do people remember the book of Jonah for? You know it, like I know it. They remember the book of Jonah for the miracle of the whale or the great fish. And the fact that Jonah was in it and he survived, and it says in chapter 1, verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. But I submit to you, the whale wasn't the greatest miracle that took place in the book of Jonah. The greatest miracle was the reviving and the saving of quite possibly over a million souls. And what a work of God that truly was. So the people of Nineveh believe God. But you know, I want to encourage you in this. Many would have said, if Jonah's day was anything like our day, they would have said, what a preacher Jonah was. Oh, I book him for a conference now. We'll give him a call to our church. What a revival he was leading that. But truth be told, would you really want Jonah <laughs> leading up the work? Because Jonah wasn't a mighty preacher. Jonah wasn't even a faithful preacher. But doesn't it just show off the grace of God afresh that God could do that with a disobedient prophet? And how much more could God do with one that was willing to go the first time and one that was willing to go immediately and be a, a doer of the word promptly as we learn in this book? Because we find there are others in the scriptures. We read of Noah. Noah preached for 120 years. He saw no one saved but his family. Was Noah any less of a preacher than Jonah? No. In fact, Noah could be commended as a greater and more faithful witness. You read of Jeremiah, you read of Isaiah, you read of many of the prophets. They didn't have a wonderful ministry at all. Some of them didn't see a single soul saved, as far as we can tell in Scripture. But is our success are our results a matter of how many people got saved? It's not. It's about faithfulness to God. It's about faithfulness to God. Come with me to 1 Samuel 12. 1 Samuel 12 and the verse 24. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 12 verse 24. We find Samuel, he's appealing to God's people here. It's a time of all of the, the grievance that was Israel asking for a king. And we find Samuel eventually, as the Lord does, they, they give in to the request. But Samuel has a message, a closing word upon his heart that he wants to get across. And he wants to get across this idea of being faithful. And he says in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and the verse 24, if you're going to do something, if you're going to do something with your life, it's not a matter of seeing a grand and great revival. It's not a matter of having your name in lights. It's not a matter of having books and documentaries all about you. It's not a matter of being a great man. It's not about fame or fortune, money, any of those things. What counts with God is faithfulness. That's what Samuel's trying to get across. 1 Samuel 12 and the verse 24, only, I've underlined that word only in my Bible. The word only means only, it's nothing else, there's no caveat, there's no alteration, there's no extra points, there's no comment in, in brackets or parentheses, there's nothing like that. Only means only, 
There's one thing he wants from God's people now. And what does the word say? Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with, with all your heart. I've underlined the word all in my Bible as well. Only and all, two vital words there. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. But consider how great things he had done for you. You know, the wonderful thing is this. In the scriptures, we read of many men in the Bible that went through a rough time and didn't see the results that Jonah saw, but they were far more faithful than Jonah were. And in the glory, they will be acknowledged as such. But our priority is faithfulness. And I trust we'll understand that. But then we not only find the promptness of the revival, the priority in the revival, the people of the revival. I want you to notice, fourthly, the practice in the revival. The practice in the revival. This is something that's missing today. This is something that's missing. But what do we read now in the verse 5 of Jonah chapter 3? So the people of Nineveh believed God, look at it now, and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. That's something that's missing. How do we know these people were really saved? Because their belief in God was accompanied with repentance of sin. They were sorry for their sin. They were grieved by their sin. There was a turning from their sin. You see, we live in a day and generation, a Christendom of easy believism. Believe God, say your ABC of the sinner's prayer, and just carry on living the way you are living. You don't have to change a thing as long as you go to church an hour on a Sunday. You can live like a devil Monday through Saturday. That's the type of Christianity on offer in most evangelical circles today. That's the reality of it. And so many love the idea of trust Jesus, believe Jesus, come to Jesus with no repentance, no turning from sin, and no tears over that sin either. We find this is a real revival. Why? Because they believe God, they proclaimed a fast, they put on sackcloth. They, were, they, were, they knew they had sinned against God. They, they knew they knew that they had to acknowledge their, their sins or their iniquities and their transgressions before the Holy One. Now, the Old Testament way of showing that repentance was doing exactly this, a fast. Now, I have a wee commentator's note here. What's a fast? It was used to break them away from their gaiety and give deep solemnity to their conduct. It was to show between them and the Lord that they were doing business with God over their sin. There's a solemnity here. Why did they uh, put on the sackcloth? Why did the king later on put on the ashes as well and command everyone to do that? What sackcloth? It's this dark clothing. It's made out of goat or, or camel hair, and it was itchy. It wasn't comfortable. And it was this idea of, 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 of hunger and this idea of being in discomfort and showing that the sorrow and the discomfort and all those terrible things that ultimately sin brings to the soul of an individual and putting it on show before the Lord that I'm willing to do these things and showing my turning from my sin. And ultimately, revival always leads or begins from or is accompanied with repentance. If there's no repentance, it's not genuine revival. If there's no turning from sin, then it's not genuine revival. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and the verse 14. This is maybe one of the most famous verses we like to quote and read and pray concerning revival. And the key elements to this revival verse is repentance, repentance from sin, turning from sin, turning to the Lord. And it says in 2 Chronicles 7 and the verse 14, if my people, referring not to the people of Nineveh now, this is a word for the people of God in Monish Lane, if my people, if God's children, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, the problem is we want the revival without the repentance, don't we? We want the revival without the turning from our secret sins. We want God to move in a wonderful way, but we, we still want the skeleton in the closet as well, don't we? 
That's the problem. When God's people turn from their wicked ways, that's when God will move. Come with me to Proverbs, please. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28 in the verse 13. We read here another piece of advice from the wonderful wisdom of Solomon. And we read in Proverbs 28, and look at the verse 13 with me, please. And this is a warning to God's people and also an encouragement to God's people because it tells us here this is the key to revival. This is following on from 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. It then says, Proverbs 28, verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. You can't have sin and sanctification in the same life. You can't do it. You have one or the other. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't do it. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But look at the verse 13 again. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's what we need today. That's what we need to see happen. The practice of this revival. Come back with me to Jonah chapter 3 verse 5. They fasted and they put on sackcloth and ashes. But then number five, we see the promptness, the priority, the people, the practice. Number five, the promoting of the revival. The promoting of the revival. Now, this is something that I had never noticed before about the book of Jonah. And I trust it will be an encouragement to God's people. But come with me to Luke chapter 11, if you would, please. <clears throat> Luke chapter 11, we find that the Lord Jesus had quite a bit to say about Jonah. They had a bit to say about Jonah in the whale, and we know that Jonah in the whale or in the great fish was a picture. It was a type of the resurrection. Reminds us, pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. But something more. There's two types in the book of Jonah. And we find Jonah is a type of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we find Jonah is also a type of a Christ that was going to come and preach the word and do miracles and a type of one that was going to come and, and do wonderful things among the people. Look what it says in Luke chapter 11 and the verse 30. Luke chapter 11, verse 30, it says, For as Jonah, so for as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, what does that mean? Jonah was a sign. It was a sign unto the Ninevites. Now, you may say, yeah, I understand how the Son of Man, how the Lord Jesus Christ is a sign to this generation. I understand that the Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfectly righteous life. I understand his, his miracles, his preaching. It was patently obvious to anybody that had open eyes that Christ was the Messiah, and he was a sign to this generation, but ultimately he was a sign that was rejected. But Jonah, he was a sign unto the Ninevites. Now, I would argue from this verse in Luke chapter 11 and the verse 30 that this means that Jonah... Well, let me put it in the words of Hugh Martin. He, he will explain it better. He says, The Ninevites, without knowledge of his history, he could not have been assigned to them. What does that mean? Hugh Martin and other commentators believe that by what the Lord says there, that when Jonah ran into Nineveh, that the Ninevites already knew that it had been swallowed by the great fish, that it had been spewed out on dry land, and the Lord had given him a personal and a wonderful and a miraculous deliverance. And the Ninevites already knew his history before he even opened his mouth to preach. And that's what they believe the Lord is talking about there. That, Nineveh, uh, that Jonah, just by walking through the gates, that he was a sign unto them that he was a sign of the mercy of God and also a sign of the judgment of God. He was a physical embodiment of the gospel that God will punish disobedience, but God will also be merciful to the repentant heart. And that he was a sign to them by the very fact that he walked through the gates of Nineveh that people could see this man was punished. He's punished for running. He's punished for trying to go to, to Joppa and then further afield to Tarshish. This man was punished for his sin, his disobedience, but the Lord was willing to show him grace. And as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so the Son of Man was a sign unto this generation, an embodiment of grace, full of grace 
and truth. Now you say, how could that be? We read in chapter 2 of Jonah and the verse 10, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. How could they have known? Well, let me put it this way. You know better than I do that in the countryside, if you have a wee bit of gossip, it doesn't take long for that to get round the people. If there's something a wee bit juicy and worth passing on, it doesn't take long before a whole country knows about it. And that's true of the countryside. But you look at the various people that would have been witnesses here. We find that there could have been, in Jonah chapter 2 and the verse 10, there could have been a flock of people stood on the beach and watched this fish come up, this fish come and spit this man out. There could have been a whole host of witnesses to that. We don't know. It's speculation, of course, but it could have happened. Look in Jonah chapter 1 and the verses 15 and 16. We find there's at least some people that were witness to the whole thing in the sense that they knew that they put him in the sea, and that was the sailors. And it says of verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. These men understood what had gone on because they put him overboard and they saw the storm cease. And look at the verse 16. It was so prevalent and so clear to them. It says, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now that ship, That ship was on the verge of shipwreck. That ship had all its wares cast overboard. That ship had to go into port somewhere. And if it went into Nineveh to get restocked and looked after and all the rest of it, then it would have beaten Jonah there. And these men would have told the story. You can be sure of that if they were walking with the Lord, as the verse 16 tells us. But why why the Lord tells us this man is a sign before he even opens his mouth. He is a living embodiment of the gospel to the people of Nineveh. And we find before he even begins to preach in Jonah chapter 3 and the verse 4 that there's a sign here and there's a promoting of the revival even before it happened. It really is remarkable. But then I want you to note, last of all, and very, very quickly, we see the praise from the revival. We've noted the promptness of the revival. No time was wasted. The priority in the revival, believe in God. The people of the revival, the greatest to the least. The practice in the revival, fasting, sackcloth, ashes, repentance. The promoting of the revival, this sign to the Ninevites. And then the sixth place, the praise from the revival. Come back with me to Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at the words of the Lord again concerning Jonah. And we find the Lord had that to say about Jonah. Whereas Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites. And we find that the Lord praised, praised the people of Nineveh as well. Quite remarkable, really, when we think of, when we think of Revelation 2, for instance, how the people of God, trying to go on with God, lost their first love, and the Lord said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And then we find with people like the Ninevites, wicked men, evil men, that the Lord could praise them really is a remarkable work of grace. But it says in Luke 11 and verse 32, this is the Lord speaking, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now you see the confirmation there that the revival and the repentance came through preaching. But we find these people are praised. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. They're praised for repenting. They're praised for getting right with God. They're praised for this time of reviving. They're praised for all that took place in the book of Jonah. And we find... We find that this generation the Lord is talking about in Luke chapter 11, that are greater than Jonas is here. That people repented just at seeing a man who had survived being swallowed by a fish. That man's here, and that was a remarkable thing. I'm not dumbing that down, but he's saying, now I'm Christ, I'm the Son of God, I'm the creator of the universe, I'm the one that made everything a greater than that man is here, and this generation refused to believe. 
And that generation will rise up and condemn you for your unbelief. That's what he's talking about here. That's what he's saying. And ultimately, I say this. In 2022, Monish Lane, has Northern Ireland not had many an advantage and an opportunity in the gospel? When we consider Nineveh, no time for God. They didn't even know about the true and living God until Jonah arrived and they repented. We find this generation, they had the Lord among them and they rejected him. But our generation, in Protestant Ulster tonight, there is no excuse. There's no excuse. You don't have to drive too far down the road before you see a gospel text on a tree or a lamppost or somewhere else. You don't have to drive too far down the road before you do get to a half-decent church. And I'm not just talking about a free church. I'm talking about Baptist or Evangelical or Independent Methodist, whatever. Just, just someone that preaches the gospel. This land, even when you compare it with the mainland, this land is, is covered with gospel preaching. How many advantages has this province had? And yet we're rejecting Christ. Let us make it our prayer tonight of Psalm 85 and the verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Because what inspires us in the place of prayer tonight is this. If God could do it with the Ninevites, if God could do it with possibly a million people in such a wicked place that their wickedness came up before the Lord, can the Lord not do it in Ulster? Can the Lord not do it tonight? Can the Lord not move in such might and power and not through gimmicks, not through modernization, not through liberalism or apostasy, but through the preaching of the word? Our God hasn't changed. So let's pray to this end. Yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown and let us be able to cry before the Lord so the people of money slain, believed God and proclaimed a fast and were repentant from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own namesake. Hymn number 623, please. 623, God is here and that to bless us with the Spirit's quickening power, see the cloud already bending, waits to drop the grateful shower. Let it come, O Lord, we pray thee. Let the shower of blessing fall. We are waiting. We are waiting. O revive the hearts of all. 623, standing as we sing. Let's stand together.